Up next, we have uh, Toby Grisman. He is the Global Product Manager of Automation and Data Analytics for Komatsu Mining. He has worked for Komatsu for 12 years. He holds his Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering from Bucknell University and Masters in Business Administration from Genon University. While working at Komatsu, he has focused a majority of his time on the development of the room and pillar system and the integration of this system into a mining infrastructure. Please welcome Toby Grisman. So, good afternoon. As mentioned there, I'm Toby Crestman, and just to clarify my role there, I'm on the underground soft rock side of Komatsu, so our, our drum miners, our haulage vehicles, uh, battery haulers, shuttle cars, FCTs. Automation has some very clear benefits, like productivity and safety, but there are others that don't get as much press or attention. Today I'm here to discuss automation and how data analytics can assist in improving productivity and reviewing some of those less talked about benefits. I think it is important we digest all those benefits so we ensure that we get the right solutions in place to our customers and work together to create value. Now, to get us started and give a little background, I'm going to talk about uh, productivity modeling that we do at Commodity with our customers. And uh, what you see here is just, uh, some data inputs that we put into these models. And it's not critical that we understand all these numbers and digest them all, but I wanted to highlight with automation some of the numbers we can really go after. So a lot of our customers are looking to turn those travel time in and out into productivity time, whether, whether it's lunch time, we try to improve it. And then with automation, we also have the opportunity to increase the, the availability of the equipment because we're a bit more benign to it in automation. And then also our models plug in an operator efficiency score. So usually we're right around between the 90 to 95%. Uh, but with automation, we can bump that up a bit because um, they're just better in automation. The machines run a bit smoother and, and to plan. So the goal there, uh, as you can see the effective shift hours in the bottom left hand, the goal to the automation is to increase those effective shift hours by improving uh, the available time for the equipment. This is a big chart. Uh, the goal isn't to read all the numbers, but we're looking at the right hand column there. So the outputs of these models um, are for our customers, whether they're trying to add additional haulage or change a feature or change the entire method of uh, mining, we work with them to understand what the, what the tonnage could be. So I, I just wanted to give a glimpse of of what the output could be there from these models. At Komatsu, on the underground side, this is a, a non-traditional roadmap of where we're going with automation. Uh, we started at the face, where the, where the value story is much greater, with the continuous miner. We'll talk mostly today about continuous miner automation. But we're also focused on haulage, things we can do with the FCT, which is the flexible conveyor train, our battery power, our battery haulers, our shuttle cars, and also our bolting equipment. As we're all aware in the underground space, there's a lot more to what goes on in a section than that, though. And, and automation and autonomy will be very difficult as we start to talk about changing picks and managing utilities and ventilation, all those, those uh, back-end aspects of, of the, uh, the section. So, but without further ado, on to the continuous minor automation. At Komatsu, we've taken a very phased approach to what we call automation, but also operator assist functions. So we've the important part is as we go work through this presentation, uh, we're going to re reference these levels, so it's good to understand um, level one, two, three, and so on. If you're not familiar with our equipment, uh, a drum miner has a sump and shear cycle that sumps in at the top, shears down, backs up, cleans the floor, and, and goes through different, um, different cycles depending on the application. So level zero is essentially fully controlled by the operator. They're using no assist features, and the operator is in full control. Basic level one uh, automation or operator assist is one touch shear. So the operator can set the floor and roof points and the machine will continuously hit those, those spots. But the operator is still in control of how far the machine sumps into the face. With our level two automation, we start to control that sump depth now. Uh, depending on the application, this can be uh, kind of a time-based. Uh, it's, it's, time-based is a little bit of a the wrong nomenclature, but that's the idea of it. It will hit a, a set sump depth, and there's some algorithms that control for motor slip and some other things that go on in the control system. In certain applications, we can get absolute sump depth, depending on what the haulage is behind it. But essentially, in this, in this uh, level of automation, the customer can define what their cut sequence needs to look like uh, to support their operations. For our level three automation, 
This is in uh, initial trial states in, in, or trial state in the UK. Uh, we're using LIDARs to control the heading. So in level two automation, the machine will continue to cut and cut and cut until the operator intervenes or, or trips it out. With level three, but I guess back to the level two, if the machine would skew, the operator would need to fix the direction of the machine and the heading there. Where in level three, we are using those LIDARs to, to keep the machine straight. So we'll start to walk through each level of automation and what the data looks like that's coming off the machine. So this is actual machine data, and there's a lot of lines in this graph, but the key thing is we have time going across the x-axis, and the main line there that I've highlighted is, is blue, is the CM boom height. You can see how erratic the boom height is. So this is watching, or this is monitoring the height of the boom and how long it's at a certain position. So you can see generally, if you're not familiar, that, let's see if this laser works, Essentially, these times at the top, or the top of the sump, or top of the, the shear cycle, how long it's sumping for. You can see the differences uh, between uh, the various sump and shear cycles. With that comes inconsistent roof, inconsistent floor, and from a productivity standpoint, they got roughly six cycles in 30 minutes. Each one of these uh, pumps is a cycle. When we walk, when we step to our level one automation. Uh, now we're talking, if we re reference back to that chart before, we're talking about operator assist feature that controls the height and the floor. But the operator is still in control of the sump depth. So immediately we see much more control over the roof and the floor, but we still see some inconsistencies on how long the machine is sumping and shearing. These bottom graph, there's a lot of noise there, but essentially we're looking at motor amperages. So you can see that they're bouncing around, and if we, look, if we go back to level zero, there are quite more uh, differences there between each cycle. We're in level one, we're already seeing considerable improvement, and the productivity has gone up to 12 cycles in 44 minutes. When we go to level two automation, now where the, uh, we're using the sequence table, you can see that the sump depths are consistent, the time's consistent, uh, the heights are consistent, and you also see the motor amperages have calmed down quite a bit and are more consistent. So now we're getting better floor, better roof, and we're being better on the machine. Productivity has also gone up to 16 cycles in 40 minutes. So tying some of this back into our productivity modeling, uh, this is all information that can be customized by the customer uh, coming out of our Grafana or our data analytics portal there. So if we look at this top right chart, uh, we're looking at kind of a histogram of the sump and shear cycle times. So we can take that information and feed it back into our productivity models, uh, which is really the, the sump and shear cycle is really the backbone of those models, so we can validate uh, the assumptions we've made and look to improve. If we see we're missing somewhere where we thought we'd be better, we can plug it in and uh, look for improvements. I also touched on operator uh, efficiency rating earlier. You can see here uh, this graph helps with the validation aspect of, of some of these features. So this line that will jump up to roughly 512, uh, we can have it set so from a mine operation standpoint, you can see what mode the machine's running in. So if that line would be running at 256, it would be in the one touch shear mode. When that line jumps up to 512, you're in the level two automation. So from a mine standpoint, you can op monitor operators and the productivity that's coming off that to see if the the technology is really giving the gains that you hope for. Also, the middle graph here, we highlight when an operator had to intervene in an automation cycle there. So you can see anytime this orange line jumps up that that was manual uh, operator intervention. So the operator can move the miner left or right. It's a split track machine uh, during the sump and shear cycle without kicking it out of automation. So he can realign it without um, disrupting productivity. So you can see there a number of cycles completed with no intervention from the operator. As we jump to our level three automation, this is now running the time base or the sequence based uh, sump and shear cycles, but also with heading control coming from the LIDAR, looking at the out by wall or the rear walls uh, to ensure that it's in line with previous cuts. This graph is similar to the other ones, but I've also highlighted, um, you can see here in red, when the heading control software actually intervened and realigned the miner. So you can see 
Uh, it came on pretty regularly and was working towards trending, uh, keeping the heading it was looking for as you can monitor degrees off course or degrees off desired heading. Again, this is in its uh, validation state in a mine in the UK. And you can see when we talk about some of the other benefits, we have much more or great improvement to the roof and floor conditions. The pictures may be a bit hard to see, uh, but there is some very smooth uh, ribs and floor. And with, with the machine taking over more controls, we can also move the operator further away from the face uh, to be in a more safe position. As you can see there, um, the Joy Service personnel monitoring it via tablet uh, or the remote. So as we look to summarize the things we discussed today, uh, Safety is a big impact, right? So improved operator safety. We take those repetitive tasks that can be system controlled out of the hands of the operators so they can focus on more mission critical tasks, reducing fatigue. We've offered a lot of different levels of automation to meet specific applications. Some customers will not be ready to dive into top level automation, their application may not allow for it, or they may not have the workforce that accepted it. You know, uh, we talked, EpiRock talked there about, about the change management piece and getting operators to accept it. For some minds, that's a difficult challenge, and it, it can be resisted if not managed properly. We talked about increased productivity. That can be clear from the cycle times there. You see from level one, we had a 28% increase in cycles, and in level two, we're up to 50% increase in cycles. With a face boss controlled system, we greatly improved the rib, the roof, and the floors. And with the lower motor amperages, we have the opportunity to extend component life and have a lower operating cost. Most importantly, all the examples you've seen today and the data we've shown today come from customer partnerships. You know, working closely with our customers to improve technology and keep the mining moving forward. Again, I'm Toby Cressman, Global Product Manager for Komatsu. And with that, is there any questions? Sakar? Uh, you talked about the level three that's happening in UK right now, sir? Yes. What type of component? Uh, it is a potash mine. By application, there's different, you know, roof control and bolt plans. Um, here, it's probably about 50 feet. Um, we have, do have some mines that bench mine, and that, that can be significantly greater once they get off their development level. But yes, the machine will continue to run in level two or level three automation unless it trips out on some, you know, air. And are you trying We do have the similar automation packages on our boulder miners and our sump miners, our EDs. The EDs can be a bit more exact with, this, with the sump and shear cycles due to the, you know, not being a traction-based sump there. It's, you know, the cylinders are driving it, so yeah. Similar automation's available. Eric? What sort of detection are you running for when the shuttle cars arrive so So, right now, uh, the machines that are running those nice cycles we show are using continuous haulage. We do have built into the software, the operators has to trip it out of automation, allow it to dump the shuttle car, and then it can cycle it back on. So it, it, it is built into the software to handle batch haulage, but the benefits need validated a bit more. You know, it's, it's easy with continuous haulage, but we are running it with batch haulage in, in certain mines. Depending on the mineral, the horizon control can be more difficult. You know, if there's a unique marker band or something we can pick on, it, it, it's, it's probably in the, you know, two to three year range. But some of the minerals are, are much harder to see a distinct marker. So um, we, can, we can keep the machine level, but picking a specific band out or following a seam will be a, it'd be a challenge for time to come. You know, and that's, that's another factor that a customer needs to make when weighing the benefits of of automation. On a continuous miner? Uh, it's, a, it's a split track machine, so it can you know, essentially turn around a center of gravity. It, it can't mine when it's spinning. You know, it, uh, depending on the mineral in, the, in the, your space, I could get you specific. We have turning diagrams made for cutting in certain applications, but it can only cut driving forward, you know, essentially, so. Should be okay to ask one more question? For sure. Yeah, and uh, some point in time, like say, console five to control the floor, using say gamma rays, like say, make it a 
size of this rest of the shell layers and all that. Something of that sort, dry edge in automation. Like say, when you don't have a marker band, or shell your, but you have a very predictable zone. Can I handle that? Just follow the flow? I mean, you could, we can follow the floor now. If there was a distance offset you were trying to, you were trying to maintain, we can build that into the sequence table to, to climb or, or go up or down based on what the mind's trying to do. Is that what you're asking? No, but suppose it, it is at a, at a, at a gradient. It's not flat. It, it's not that you're just maintaining the level. You're just trying to maintain a certain difference, maybe six inches or something from the floor. And the floor is going up and down and all that. How you have... Is, like right now our automation doesn't have, we don't have the sensors to detect, you know, the floor. So as long as there was input coming from another system, like we could make the sequence table adapt to what that number needed to be. Um, there would be some de development involved, but it's, I mean, right now we don't have gamma sensors detecting the floor. Yeah, because you say that if you don't have a marker, it might be troublesome. In the absence of a marker, maybe very distinct material that you can Yeah. We do have some, I'll say like, a, you can put it in an adaptive mode, where if the operator is regularly bumping the roof higher and higher and higher, you know, each sump and shear cycle, it will, it will learn to that new position. Um, but if, if it's a rolling floor or rolling top, you know, the, the benefits have to be weighed versus cutting additional reject material versus, you know, running an automation. All right, thank you.